Hello, hello, and welcome or welcome back to my channel. So in today's video, I'm so excited to take you guys on a journey of remixes, as in where did they come from, how did they start, and how have they changed over the years? Because I do hear and see a lot of people saying that it feels like today's remixes are lacking in a lot of regards. And I always have to give this disclaimer on every single video I make, but this video is not a list of every single remix to ever exist because if it was, we would be here until tomorrow. But more so, it's a retrospective of the concept of a remix and how we've gotten to where we are today. And since this is a pretty expansive topic, I'm gonna go mostly chronologically, but also to make it a little bit easier to understand, I will be breaking the video up into sections that are related to each specific topic that I'm gonna talk about for the remix. So let's go ahead and get into it. What we've come to call a remix generally refers to the alteration of a piece of media by adding, removing, or otherwise changing parts of it. The word remix almost always refers to music. There are several reasons remixes are made. Some of these reasons include giving a song a new meaning, altering the genre or format of a song, often for club or radio play. People have altered sounds as long as they've been able to be recorded. By the early 1940s, devices that could record sound or gave users the ability to alter recorded sounds became more accessible. The development of multi-track recording in the 1950s made it much easier to alter or substitute parts of recording while leaving other parts intact. Likewise, editing technology had improved vastly to make finer edits to such recordings. A common example is cut editing or editing media by physically cutting the magnetic recording tape. The desired pieces were then rejoined with an adhesive. Side note, but this is actually where the phrase leaving something on the cutting room floor originates because that film or audio would be physically cut out. Cut editing is still used today, I do it for these videos actually, but of course it's still mostly done on computers now. Similar to sampling, a lot of the remixes roots trace back to the Jamaican reggae and eventually dance hall scene of the late 60s and early 70s. DJs cut together, aka remix songs of different genres in order to suit the audience's different tastes. These DJs also swap different instrumental tracks under their vocals to essentially create new versions of the same songs. American producer Tom Moulton became known in the 70s for his mini disco remixes. Popular examples include his remixes of Gloria Gaynor's 1974 cover of Never Can Say Goodbye. Moulton was often asked to remix songs specifically to be formatted for radio, be it changing instruments like drums in the song or making the song shorter altogether. Molson is also credited with the creation of the disco breakdown section in songs or the extended instrumental period, which is often where instrumental solos take place. The disco break and musical breaks in general are instrumental in remixing as they create space for artists to add more vocals if they desire and also give DJs a spot in the songs to begin transitioning into the next. Aside from that, extending the songs with a break and seamlessly blending them into the next kept people on the dance floor for much longer. These new ways of making music not only revolutionized disco, but soon led to the creation of house music. Chicago's most recent contribution to the American music scene is how it got its name. So-called house music was first made in the creator's houses, but it was also performed at clubs called the Warehouse and Powerhouse. However it got its name, it's one of the hottest things going, and as Jay Levine reports, it may only be a matter of time before house musicians become heroes in their own home. <laughs> They started playing house music at this Michigan Avenue hotel and health club last summer, and they've been packing them in ever since. It's the first time house has escaped the south side dance clubs or north side juice bars for a more upscale audience, though it's still a long way from sweeping the city. House was and still is a staple in several clubs. Often, house DJs alter disco songs to make them sound more mechanical and electronic with apparatus like synthesizers and drum machines. House music, which was pioneered by black DJs, mostly the Chicago club scene, became a popular genre with many queer communities and communities of color. Pioneers of house include DJs Frankie Knuckles, Ron Hardy, Jesse Saunders, and Silk Hurley. House music would later travel to Europe where it became a very popular staple and club genre over there as well. Aside from dancehall, disco, and house, hip hop has also heavily impacted the remix. Honestly, it's the genre that most people do associate with remixing. This makes sense as the nature of remixing itself being a form of altering recordings is embedded into hip hop culture. Just as frequently as rappers love to hop on each other's beats, there's also a fondness for taking a song or beat and creating a new product from it. Busta Rhymes has said this tendency is born out of the competitive nature of hip hop to either put the best rap over the hottest beat or create an even hotter version of a hit song. 
Often the concept of a rapper rapping over another artist's beat is referred to as a freestyle or a flip and is under the remixing umbrella. Busta related this back to the Jamaican influence on music in New York, as well as hip-hop culture up there in itself. At this time, what was considered a remix looks different from what many, especially younger generations, are most familiar with now. At their inception and decades after, remixes were usually more of a reimagining of a song that retained some of the lyrics and maybe some of the production and, of course, the original artist in most cases. But these remixes could almost sound like two completely different songs or two different interpretations of the same song, and especially in terms of hip-hop, likely added a new artist to the remix. The earliest hip-hop remixes can be traced back to the 1970s. Bronx DJ Cool Herc, who's from Jamaica, is widely credited as the inventor of hip-hop. He was known for his remixes, often aided by his use of two turntables, something he borrowed from disco tech DJs. The dual turntables is what allowed DJs to play two records at a time and mix one into the other. Like disco DJs, Cool Herc extended the musical breaks in songs because it's the part where most people dance. One night, Herc was inspired to combine the breaks of several records, naming it a merry-go-round. Then I'm noticing people's wait for particular parts of the records to dance to. Yeah. So I'm visual, I'm watching it. So I'm saying, so, oh, I saw. So let me try something out. So all the records I have that have those breakdowns in it, some I had two, some I just had one. I said, I'm going to do a thing called the merry-go-round. You tonight. made it up? Yes. As you can imagine, remixing and sampling often went hand in hand, especially at this time. Herc mixed and jumped between the breaks, creating one long instrumental that sounded different nearly every time. This is probably common to many of us who have been to clubs and parties now, but it was novel back then. Cool Herc almost always began as merry-go-rounds with bongo rock, but the genre that followed could differ from night to night. Often, the incredible bongo band's 1973 song Apache started off the merry-go-round. Ironically, the song wasn't that much of a hit until it became commonplace in a lot of New York DJs' mixes. Even if you haven't heard the original, you've likely heard Sugar Hill Gang's 1981 remix of Apache, commonly known as Jump On It. In this remix, Sugar Hill Gang reimagines the song by incorporating rapping, backing vocals, and adding synths and clapping to the production. In the 80s, mixtape culture, which was extremely popular in New York, also heavily influenced the remix. According to DJ Ted Smooth, mixtapes were sort of like a short portfolio of sorts, as DJs would attempt to show off their turntable skills in a short amount of time. At the time, these tapes were mostly referred to as blends rather than remixes. To hook the listener, these blends would quickly transition into other songs, especially at the beginning. When more of these blends or mixes were put on 12-inch records, they were more mass-produced and accessible, increasing the rappers who could potentially spit over these mixes or DJs who could further mix them. It also allowed DJs to release their mixes as official singles or even as albums. One such example is Cold Cut's 7 Minutes of Madness remix of Eric B. and Rakim's 1987 song, Paid in Full. According to XXL Magazine, Cold Cut combined over 25 records to remix Paid in Full. One of the most notable parts of the remix was the sample of Israeli singer Afra Haza's M. Ninalu. The Paid in Full remix became popular on the dance charts and was in fact the first remix to make it on the charts at all. So you can see again how remixing makes music appealing to several different audiences. As technology continued advancing, it became easier for producers and DJs without much turntable experience to remix records. Remixing was often a way for up-and-coming rappers, DJs, and producers to make a name for themselves. Remixing, of course, showed off an artist's ability not only to create a song, but take an existing one and inject their own personal touches into it. In the 1990s, Bad Boy Records became known for their remixes, many of which have been considered some of the best in hip-hop. This was still the time when most remixes were still sort of reimaginings of the songs they remixed, meaning there were often notable differences in the production. Diddy typically headed the production on these remixes, often working with not only the original artists on the remix, but his team of in-house rappers and producers that were signed to the label. One of his earliest examples is his remix of Mary J. Blige's 1992 single Love No Limit. Diddy co-produced it with Daddy O, one of the founders of Sets of Sonic. Technically, this remix was made before Bad Boy was founded in 1993, but with Love No Limit, Diddy was beginning to cement his legacy as one of the kings of the remix. Compared to the original, the Love No Limit remix is more up-tempo, includes a new sample, and includes more background vocals from Mary, as well as those of Dave Tolliver and Jodeci's Casey Haley. Diddy had previously remixed Jodeci's Come and Talk to Me. 
The Love No Limit remix retains the romantic tone of the original, but in a way that's more conducive to dancing or being played at a function. The remix to Love No Limit was included on the remix version of Mary's debut album, What's the 411? The remix album included new production on the tracks and several new features, for example, Biggie on the remix of the title track, which samples his own song, Dreams. Biggie is also featured on the Real Love remix, on which he actually shouts out Dreams. It was actually a remix that helped Biggie Smalls' the star rise. He was recruited for the 1994 remix of Craig Mack's Flava In Your Ear. This was Bad Boy's first remix after the label officially launched, and the OG version of Flava In Your Ear was actually their first release. Diddy purchased the instrumental from Easy Mo B and remixed it, leaving it mostly intact. However, on this version, Biggie opens as Diddy wanted to use this remix to introduce him to more people, which obviously worked. Several other artists feature on the remix, including LL Cool J, Rampage, and Busta Rhymes. As remixes became ever-present in hip-hop and other producers became known for their quality remixes, Diddy felt pressure to continue producing remixes that weren't just on par, but better than those of his peers. Producers like Dr. Dre, RZA, and Q-Tip were all making names for themselves now, not just because of their rap or their production, but also their remixes. One such remix that was born directly out of this competition was the 1995 remix of One More Chance, which features Faith Evans and Mary J. Blige. The song was later sampled in Ashanti's debut single, Foolish. Another popular remix of Diddy's is of Mariah Carey's Fantasy, featuring Old Dirty Bastard. When he remixed Fantasy, Diddy re-looped a different part of the Genius of Love sample from the original. In addition, he slowed some of Mariah's vocals, had her re-record others, and added a thumping hip-hop bassline to the song. Bad Boy remixed other Mariah Carey hits like her 1997 song Honey, which featured Bad Boy rappers Mace and the Locks. Diddy attributed the success of his remixes in part to there being a sense of a unified voice and style amongst the Bad Boy producers, to the point where a Bad Boy remix could relatively easily be identified. This team of Bad Boy producers were referred to as Hitmen, and included producers such as Stevie J, D-Dot, Nasheen Myrick, and Mario Winans. To cement their legacy of remixing, Diddy and the Bad Boy family released their album, We Invented the Remix, in 2002. Some of the hit remixes on the album include I Need a Girl Part 2 and the remix of Special Delivery. In 1998, the Grammys introduced the category for Best Remix Recording, which still exists today. Its inaugural winner was Frankie Knuckles for his remix of Tony Braxton's Unbreak My Heart. It's a very house-heavy remix, which is exactly what Frankie was known for, his nickname being the Godfather of House. Aside from Tony or even Mary J. Blige, several R&B artists use remixes to revamp their songs. One such example is Destiny's Child, who called on Y Club Jean to remix No No No, their first major success on the charts. As was common at the time, two separate videos were shot for the song and for the remix. The remix was included on the group's 1999 remix album, aptly titled This Is The Remix. It also included a Timbaland remix of Say My Name, Missy on the Bootylicious remix, and Jermaine Dupri, the Brat, and Bow Wow on the 7 Minute Dance Influence Jumpin' Jumpin' remix. Another example is Jagged Edge's Let's Get Married, which was remixed by Jermaine Dupri, who also produced the original. It was very common at the time for Jermaine Dupri to call these remixes So So Deaf remixes or So So Deaf mixes, or at least shout out So So Deaf at the beginning of the song. Dupri made such remixes for artists including Chingy, Mace, and several for Mariah Carey. And before we get into the section of the video, I do just want to give a quick warning that if you are sensitive to flashes on the screen, I might recommend skipping this section of the video because you know the nature of a lot of these Electro House and EDM performances that they have a lot of these flashing lights everywhere. When CDs were still one of the primary ways people listened to music, it was common for artists to release single records with several remixes or include these on the album. At least one of these mixes was almost always a club or dance mix, usually with less of their vocals. Even artists like Kylie Minogue, Britney Spears, and Madonna, who already made dance-ready pop music, benefited from having their songs remixed. In Madonna's case, several of her songs, Material Girl being a good example, were actually extended for their dance remixes, adding in more instrumental breaks. One of Britney's best examples is the Dark Child remix of Overprotected. Overprotected actually got several other remixes, including the JS16 remix and the Rip Rock and Alex remix. Basically, you wanted your single to be playable in as many settings as possible, which these dance and club mixes helped. As I touched on earlier, several European DJs made names for themselves remixing songs or creating their own Electro House remixes. 
And as a quick reminder, the act of blending together several instrumentals, even electronic ones, does fall under the remixing umbrella. One such example is Dutch DJ and producer Tiesto, considered to be one of the best DJs of all time. He got his start in the mid-90s, and several of his mixes are an EDM take on the merry-go-round concept, combining several instrumental breaks, many of which were his own creation. Tiesto has also remixed songs of several artists, including Britney Spears, J Balvin, Ty Dolla Sign, and Halsey. Common for DJs, Tiesto has also remixed other DJs' remixes. Recently, he remixed a Craze's viral remix of Cherish's 2006 song, Do It To It. Another DJ known for his remixes is Benny Benassi, who's Italian, and he's also known for pioneering electro house music. Though he'd been DJing since the 80s as a house DJ, Benny eventually transitioned into electronic music and burst into the scene in the early 2000s with his hit Satisfaction. In 2008, he won the Grammy for Best Remix Recording for remixing Public Enemies Bring the Noise. Another popular remix of his is the remix of Skrillex's Cinema. Though dubstep originated in the UK, it too has origins in the same reggae, disco, and house scenes that eventually birthed remixing and electro house music. A personal favorite Benny Benassi remix is his remix of Christina Aguilera's Beautiful because it's truly a talent to be able to turn a song like that into a club banger. Since a lot of this music has similar roots to the techniques that influence hip hop, it makes perfect sense why collaborations between electro house DJs and rappers are pretty common. Likewise, it was common for hip hop producers to take inspiration from these DJs and vice versa. An example I've mentioned before is Timbaland's protege Danger, who actually looked at Tiesto and Benny Benassi for his inspiration for producing Blackout for Britney Spears. Even in the later 2000s, EDM and electro house music weren't as mainstream, so clumps were still pretty much the only place to hear it. Similar to hip hop, not the same, but similar, EDM and Electro House were often looked down upon because they were considered lowbrow and associated with drugs and clubs. However, just years later, in the 2010s, European Electro House DJs were all the rage. Aside from their electronic merry-go-round mixes, they were also known for their collaborations with artists. Often it was these electronic merry-go-round mixes, albeit shorter radio-friendly versions, that underlaid the collaborations. So yes, I am saying that without reggae or disco or even hip hop, you likely wouldn't have a lot of your favorite EDM, dance house, or electro house songs. And that's why to this day, a lot of these genres are closely linked and still influence each other. A prime example from this time period was Friends DJ David Guetta. Similar to many of his peers, he got a start in the 80s as a house DJ in Paris and has since added EDM and electro pop to his repertoire. Geta made his international breakthrough in 2009 due to Love Takes Over, his collaboration with Europop queen Kelly Rowland. In 2013, Billboard named the song the best dance pop collaboration of all time. Geta gained further popularity in the US due to collaborations like Sexy Bitch with Akon, Who's That Chick with Rihanna, Memories with Kid Cudi, and co-producing Black Eyed Peas as I Got a Feeling. It felt like at this time, as soon as it got a little warm outside, David Geta was topping the charts. Geta also collaborated with several rappers, including Nicki Minaj and the songs Turn Me On, Where Them Girls At, and Hey Mama. He also collaborated with Florida, also on Where Them Girls At, as well as the anthemic party song Club Can't Handle Me. Florida frequently collaborated with his DJs, a popular example being his 2011 song Good Feeling. Good Feeling samples Swedish DJ Avicii's levels and includes a break, a dubstep one at that, toward the end, compounding so many layers of the history of remixing all in one song. Avicii was one of the leading DJs of the 2010s, known not only for his electro house mixes, but also for his remixes. Often, he released single albums containing multiple remixes of the same song, examples being Addicted to You, Silhouettes, and even Levels. Several of these single albums contain remixes with other DJs like Tiesto, David Guetta, and Skrillex. Two other popular DJs of this ilk are Zed and Calvin Harris. Zed, who's German, is well known for his EDM pop collaborations like Clarity and Break Free, though he too has several remix albums to his name. Calvin Harris is also well known for his pop collaborations with artists including Rihanna, Ellie Goulding, and Florence Welch. Some of his remixes include that of Florence and the Machine Spectrum, Halsey's Alone, and The Killers When You Were Young. Of course, DJs from other countries were remixing too. Major Lazer, a group made of Jamaican, English, Trinidadian, and American artists were also well known for their remixes. They remixed songs from artists including Tyga, The Weeknd, Meg Thee Stallion, and Ariana Grande. Then of course, Major Lazer also does remixes and collaborations with other EDM artists like Flux Pavilion and DJ Snake. Often you can hear the dancehall and reggae influence in their music. Currently, Major Lazer is a trio made of Diplo, Walshy Fire, and Ape Drums. 
Past members include Switch, who was a founding member, and Jillionaire. Steve Aoki, probably one of the most famous DJs in the world, has also done several remixes. A very popular one is the 2009 remix of Kid Cudi's Pursuit of Happiness, heavily popularized by the party-focused film Project X. Steve Aoki has created remixes of a wide array of songs, including ones by J Balvin, Timbaland, and even the Beach Boys. He's also done remixes of K-pop songs, for example, BTS's Mic Drop and Idol's Nude. I want to circle back again to the 2000s and 2010s, but this time outside the scope of EDM, Electro House, or any of those types of collaborations. As hip-hop was the dominant genre at the time, it was very common for rappers to hop on remixes with other artists. Like the 90s, it was also common for several rappers to team up on one remix. For instance, there are multiple remixes of the Terror Squad's 2004 song, Lean Back. Two of the remixes include features from Lil Jon, Eminem, and Mace. The differences between the two are that the Crunk Juice mix obviously features more Lil Jon and eliminates Remy Ma's extra verse that's included on the All or Nothing mix, that being the most popular remix. Fat Joe released another Lean Back remix with Puerto Rican artist Tego Calderon and Tony Touch. In addition, artists including G-Unit, Jadakiss, and Lil Wayne have remixed Lean Back as well. Back then, and even still, Lil Wayne was well known for hopping on a remix. He's included on the remixes of a remarkable array of artist songs that includes Destiny's Child, Akon, T.I., Gucci Mane, and even Kesha. Wayne was also well known for his freestyle remixes, so much so that it became a running joke that artists would just accept defeat as soon as they heard Wayne was going to jump on one of their beats. Another important quality of their remix, or result I should probably say, is that they often become more popular than the original song. Regardless, this still benefits the artist, so they usually do welcome it. R. Kelly's Ignition remix peaked at number two on the Hot 100, though the original version of the song didn't even chart. R. Kelly had initially recorded Ignition for his leaked album Loveland, and prior to his arrest for sleeping with an underage girl on tape, allegedly. The Ignition remix was released less than six months after that, and like I said, ascended the charts to spot number two. This whole timeline is news to me because I was obviously so young when the song came out, but it speaks perfectly to what people will excuse from artists so long as they enjoy their work. In 2001, Jayla released the single I'm Real as the fourth single from her self-titled album. Soon after, she released the Murder remix with Ja Rule, which used entirely different production, different samples, and had a different video. The remix outperformed the original, topping the Hot 100 for five consecutive weeks. It performed so well that it took JLo's self-titled album from number 90 on the charts back into the top 10. The success of the I'm Real remix actually inspired a change in Billboard policy that I'll talk about later. Though the original version of I'm Real and the remix sounded like two completely different songs, since they had the same title and one was billed as a remix, radio and airplay counted the songs as one. This of course meant the frequent airplay of the remix still counted towards sales in the chart position of the original. So in a sense, this meant an artist could create basically a separate song, title it the same as another one of theirs and just call it a remix, then use that song to boost chart position, sales, and to even break records. JLo and Murder Inc. were accused of doing this on the remix of another one of her songs, Ain't It Funny, which was called Two Entirely Different Songs with the same title. Like I'm Real, the remix outperformed the original and went number one in March of 2002. Both the I'm Real and Ain't It Funny remixes were included on J to the LO, the remixes, which was released a month prior. The album was actually the first remix album to debut at number one, which wouldn't happen again until Justin Bieber released Never Say Never, the remixes, in 2011. But about this Billboard rule change. Back in 2002, after the two JLo remixes dominated the charts and did huge numbers that helped the original versions, there were complaints to Billboard that this was unfair. Billboard then changed the rules so that airplay of songs with identical titles, yet significantly different melodies, could not be combined. This was even the case if the song was referred to as a remix. And I'm going to use this change in rules to support a theory that I have later on in the video, so hang tight. In yet another case of a remix outdoing an original, in 2007, Lil Boozy and Webby remixed Fox's Wipe Me Down. The remix was actually the version that was released as a single. Though it technically wasn't even his song originally, Lil Boozy was listed as the lead artist and has been considered the standout artist on the song. Moving further into the 2000s, and more especially in the 2010s, we begin to see less remixes as reworks or imaginings, especially in regards to pop, hip-hop, and R&B. What I mean is that production-wise overall, several of these newer remixes didn't stray very far from the original song. Typically, instead of a difference in production, the major draw was a new artist being featured on the track. 
One of the most common formulas was swapping out the second or third verse for the feature, or even letting the featured artist open the remix and then pretty much keeping the production the same. And of course, that's me painting with broad strokes. But overall, the change is noticeable, especially in terms of remixes meant for radio or otherwise mainstream consumption. To get what I mean, think of something like the 2010 S&M remix, which keeps nearly the exact same production as Rihanna's original version, just with the addition of some ad-libs and the inclusion of Britney Spears. Another example you're likely familiar with is Taylor Swift's Bad Blood remix, which features Kendrick Lamar. Though this was largely the case for more mainstream songs, that doesn't mean the concept of the remix as a rework was completely lost. Personally, one of my all-time favorite examples is the 2014 Crazy in Love remix for Fifty Shades of Grey. It perfectly captures the intoxicating, overwhelming feeling of love, especially with Beyonce's slower, alluring, and almost haunting vocals. I'm sure that this is a controversial take, but I actually prefer this version to the original. Overall, I think Beyonce is a prime example of an artist who over her career has mostly used her remixes to reinvent her songs. Another great example is the Flawless remix from 2013, which aside from alterations to the production, includes new verses from Beyonce, as well of course the feature from Nicki Minaj. And though Beyonce is just the feature here, I have to acknowledge the Savage remix. Though Meg's solo version was already a viral smash, their collaboration on the remix earned acclaim not only for their chemistry, but for actually transforming the song. It also earned Meg her first number one on the Hot 100. Jumping back to our original timeline, another example I want to highlight is Fall Out Boy's 2015 album Make America Psycho Again. The album is fully composed of hip-hop remixes of songs from their previous album American Beauty, American Psycho. Several of the remixes keep the spirit of the tracks, but have a darker, uninhibited quality to them. I think I actually brought this album up in my trap music video just because of how frequently trap is used on the album. A lot of the production is inverted or completely altered on the album. Some of the features included are ASAP Ferg, Azalea Banks, Juicy J, Wiz Khalifa, and I Love McConan. In recent memory, it seems like a lot of these The Feature Is The Remix remixes have dominated the charts. And in several, as was the case over a decade ago with J-Lo, the remix helped the original song climb the charts and in some cases take it to number one. When Doja Cat released the remix of Say So, which featured Nicki Minaj, the song finally went number one. Prior, Say So had been sitting at number four, which honestly is still a great chart position. The remix of Dua Lipa's Levitating, which featured the baby, gave the song the push it needed to go viral, propelling it on the charts. Due to its success, Billboard named Levitating the Hot 100 song of 2021. The same was true for the song in the UK, as the popularity of the Blessed Madonna remix pushed the song higher on the charts, and after it fell off, the DaBaby remix helped it re-enter the charts altogether. Ariana Grande's first release of 2021 was the 3435 remix, which featured Doja Cat and Meg Thee Stallion. Again, there are minor, if any, changes made to the production, and the rap features are basically inserted to the song. But this remix does get points for me overall because they shot another video for it, which is always fun. Though the original version of 3435 peaked at number 8, the remix brought the song to a peak position of number 2. Just months ago, Ariana Grande featured on the remix of The Weeknd's 2016 song Die For You. Again, the only notable difference is the inclusion of Ariana as the featured artist. I actually did a poll at this time, so while I can't speak for how everyone felt, I can speak for at least around 7,000 people, and as far as that poll goes, and some threads I found on Reddit actually, the consensus was that the feature was sort of underwhelming and unnecessary. Not that people hated it, they just thought that it didn't add much to the original, which a lot of people already loved. On its original chart run, Die For You peaked at number 43 on the Hot 100. Last year, the song re-entered the charts after going viral on TikTok and peaked at number 6. It wasn't until the release of the remix that Die For You finally topped the charts. At the time I'm recording this, the song is currently sitting at number 11 on the Hot 100. A couple weeks ago, Kendrick Lamar hopped on the remix of Beyonce's America Got A Problem and his verses actually opened the song. Sort of atypical for Beyonce, this remix is basically the same as the original, but with the inclusion of the Kendrick feature. Personally, my favorite remix so far from Renaissance is the Cuff It remix because it already takes an upbeat, fun summary song and then turns it into a summer slow jam. And I do think that this is a lot more in line with what we've come to expect from a Beyonce remix, as in she reworks the song and makes it something new. Though we might get more remixes as there are rumors a Renaissance remix album might be coming. And of course, I cannot talk about recent remixes without mentioning Ice Spice, who's having a run on the charts right now with them. Her first remix to chart was Boy's a Liar Part 2, a remix of the Pink Panther song. 
Though Pink Panthers was already known by many people online, the remix not only earned her her first chart entry on Billboard, but opened her up to a much wider audience, especially here in the States. Boys a Liar peaked at number 3 on the Hot 100 and is currently sitting at number 15. Ice Spice followed that up with a remix of her own song, Princess Diana, which Nicki Minaj featured on. The Princess Diana remix topped the Billboard Hot Rap Songs chart, making it the first time two women held the spot. On the Hot 100, the song peaked at number 4. The Princess Diana remix quickly shot to number 1 on iTunes, which extended Nicki's record as the rapper with the most number 1s on the platform. As of a couple weeks ago, Ice Spice featured on the remix of Taylor Swift's song, Karma. And the Karma remix just debuted on the Hot 100 at number 2. With this new news, this makes Ice Spice the artist with the most top 10, even top 5, hits on the Billboard Hot 100 so far for 2023. So now, I do want to come back to that theory that I said I had. As I said, in 2002, Billboard made it so that remixes wouldn't count for the original song's numbers if those songs were considered to be too different from each other. So my theory is that in this streaming and charts-obsessed musical landscape we find ourselves in, artists, or at least their teams, don't want to make too many changes to their remixes so as not to disqualify its ability to support the performance of the original song. Because it does seem now, at least to me, that often remixes are done not to explore or expand on a song, but just to revive it and push it up a couple spots in the charts. And I don't want to say that I'm the only person on planet Earth who has this theory because it's a pretty logical conclusion to come to, honestly. I'm not saying back in the 80s and 90s artists were just remixing songs out of the kindness of their hearts, but at the time they definitely had more leeway to remix a song and still have it count as a byproduct of its original. And of course, I mostly mean this in the sense of songs intended to perform well in the mainstream, which is exactly why I've been bringing up chart positions so much. While I know several artists are genuine in their choice of collaborators, it still seems like in so many cases the goal is just to get a trending artist on a remix to make it viral and ascend the charts. And I know music is a business and whatnot, but overall it's just starting to feel a lot less organic. But maybe I'm just being cynical. I said earlier that creating remixes of songs that are significantly different from the original is still very common in the electronic music space. I wanted to touch on that some more and give some current examples. Aside from the Electro House and EDM I mentioned earlier, this is still extremely present in the hyper-pop and avant-pop spaces. A prime example of this is Gaga's 2021 album, The Dawn of Chromatica, which is the remix album of Chromatica. Several of the remixes add a more warped, mechanical, sort of electronic, all elements of hyper-pop by the way, quality to the Chromatica songs, which were originally more dance and house inspired. This is a logical progression as hyperpop is largely derived from electronic, house, and dance music, as well as pop, of course. Most of the artists who remix the tracks for Dawn of Chromatica are well known in the hyperpop and avant pop scenes. They include Arca, A.G. Cook, Miramasa, and Dorian Electra. Some of the singers recruited for the remixes include Brie Runway, Rina Sawayama, Charlie XCX, Shy Girl, and Ash Nico. The tracks on Dawn of Chromatica sound like hyperpop infused versions of the club mixes I brought up earlier. Several of them make use of the extended break and the merry-go-round production that stitches several abstract and robotic instrumentals together. Since hyperpop is an experimental genre and one born out of several genres where remixing is essential, I think we will continue to see creative remixes in this space. Part of the beauty of hyperpop is that a lot of it is music for music's sake, meaning the songs aren't usually created with the intention of topping the charts, but to stretch music making technology and human creativity to their fullest. Similar to its house and disco predecessors, hyperpop was and still kind of is, but less so, both an underground genre and one rooted in queerness. It's very common for artists whose personal identities often feel as though they're on the periphery of the mainstream to not be as concerned with making art to appeal to spaces where they generally aren't accepted or truly seen. And of course, within the hyperpop and experimental electronic spaces, it's common for artists to remix songs of their peers in their genre. Aside from the 911 remix, A.G. Cook has remixed several songs Charlie's on, including Beg For You and Spinning. Dylan Brady of 100 Gex also has several hyperpop remixes under his belt, including Blame It On Your Love, Earring, and his own song Ringtone. His production, even in the remixes, is typified by jarring metallic sounds that almost make you feel as if you're wedged inside the gears of a machine. Before her untimely passing, Sophie also remixed for several artists, including Fletcher, Yell, and Bayside. Her production is usually characterized by a heavier, thumping bass line that is lightened by brighter elements like bells chiming and bubbles popping. Another place where it feels like remix culture is alive and well is actually TikTok. 
It's more common to hear mashups or remixes of popular songs on the app than it is to hear the original versions of those songs. Because of this, users have been exposed to music they might not have otherwise heard, and it's breathed new life in a decades-old songs, as well as renewed interest in artists from generations past. In a way, it's sort of a full circle moment, because over 50 years later, many of these TikTok remixes and mashups have a similar homemade DIY quality to the artists who pioneered the concept of the remix and all of its subsequent genres. I know I took y'all on so many twists and turns in this video, so I appreciate you for bearing with me, but it's kind of impossible not to do because as I've always said, music is always in conversation with each other. So it's very difficult to talk about remixes without talking about the genres that helped create it and without talking about the genres that came from it. So like I said, I hope it wasn't too difficult to follow. And if it was, I do apologize. You know, I do my best. I do what I can here. And down in the comments, I do want to know two things, two thoughts of yours, if you will. The first one is let me know if you prefer the remix as a reimagining where it's more of a rework of a song or if you prefer the remix in the sense of what's more mainstream nowadays, as in it's just mostly the same production, but a new artist featuring on the song, and then that's the remix. And then of course, you already know the second one, let me know your favorite remix, because I'm gonna listen to, maybe not all of them, but I will listen to a lot of them if I haven't heard them before, because you guys do put me onto a lot of good songs on this channel. As always, thank you so very much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so that you can stick around for more. Also, make sure you follow me on Twitter so that you can keep up with me there. And if you'd like to become a channel member, the link is in the video's description. Again, thank you so very much for watching. I love you so very much, and I will see you so very soon. Bye-bye.